A male emu wren calls stridently from his vantage point, deep in the arid heart of the Tanami Desert. His territory spans a tiny patch of a landscape renowned as one of the most inhospitable on earth. But after years of drought, he has been granted a reprieve from the desert's merciless ferocity. Two years of above average rainfall have ensured that plenty of insects are available to eat and the vast spinifex grasslands are furnished in new growth. For the emu wrens, there is no time to waste. They scurry secretively through the spinifex. At only 12 centimetres, they are Australia's smallest emu wren and have bred up quickly to colonise the spinifex expanse. But their story is no isolated incident. Inland Australia is experiencing a rejuvenation, a time of plenty which is as rare as it is spectacular. This remarkable transformation is nowhere more evident than at the Cooper Creek in northern South Australia. The Cooper Creek originates in southwestern Queensland, from where it meanders for 1,300 kilometres into South Australia, eventually emptying into Lake Eyre. In June 2010, after significant rain across the inland, the Cooper's floodwaters cut across the Birdsville Track, 130 kilometres north of Maree. With the track under water, the Cooper Creek Ferry takes road users across the waterway. It last operated in 1990, a 20-year gap which highlights the incredible rarity of this spectacle. Where the creek channel is not as well defined, the waters spill out across vast floodplains. Coolabar trees which have endured in desolate sand for decades now stand in their own inland sea. For some, it is too late. But for those that have survived the drought, it is a time of plenty. The shallow floodplain wetlands support an abundance of water birds, the most common being the black-winged stilt. Meandering on long legs through the shallows, the stilts feed on aquatic plants and animals. Following the Cooper's flood, they have bred up considerably. Indeed, here the majority of birds are young, denoted by their dark heads. The lush wetland vegetation supports a myriad of insects. Brightly coloured dragonflies adorn the lignum and dart erratically above the water's surface. For insectivorous birds, this is a banquet. Indeed, a pair of white-winged trillers have taken full advantage, constructing a nest in a low cooler bar. Trillers are a summer breeding migrant to southern Australia. The male is boldly plumaged in black and white and calls conspicuously. His female companion sports a more conservative brown colour scheme. The nest itself is a shallow platform resembling a frying pan. When the young finally hatch, they must carefully balance upon each other to avoid falling out. This particular nest was built above water, so had one of the chicks fallen, it almost certainly would have drowned. Right now, it is summer, and the temperature is a scorching 50 degrees. It is as if the lush green landscape and flooded wetlands are totally detached from the blistering heat. But at least beside the cooper, there is shade, food and water. Further afield, in the Gibber Plains, shelter from the summer heat is a little harder to find. In April 2008, the Gibber Plains were a seemingly lifeless mirage, 
a lunar landscape where not a blade of grass dared grow from the barren ground. But the desert rains have finally returned life to this foreboding landscape. The once bare gibber stones now lie concealed beneath a carpet of green grass and succulents. For the Australian Pratt and Cole, this is about as good as it gets. Hundreds of them lie scattered across the gibber in loose flocks, yet their exceptional camouflage makes them virtually invisible. Most are young birds. Their parents were quick to breed after the rejuvenating rains. But these graceful birds are not alone. They share the plains with a variety of other species. Perhaps the most charismatic are the inland dotterels, an endemic wader which has adapted to a highly nomadic life in the arid inland. Like the Pratt and Cole, their plumage matches the rocks and sand of this landscape, where they feed mainly on vegetation and some insects. Here too are the banded lapwings, a wary bird which is quick to walk away from any intruder. Despite their bold black and white breast, the brown back provides very effective camouflage on these open plains. The banded lapwing is well distributed across much of mainland Australia, but its other co-inhabitant, the gibber bird, is restricted to the sparsely vegetated gibber plains. This fascinating bird is terrestrial in nature. It always uses a rock rather than a bush as a vantage point. Gibber birds move quickly across the ground. They search for insects, which are in abundance due to the green vegetation. After spending the day on the scorchingly hot rocks, the Pratt and Coles gather around the water to drink and cool off. Indeed, for birds in such an exposed environment, with temperatures soaring to 50 degrees, water is a scarce and sought-after commodity. Small, muddy pools attract a mixture of species, which shelter together in the shade and desperately try to cool off. Even a male songlark arrives to drink. This is a common species across most of mainland Australia, where it lives a nomadic existence in open country. The male bird is considerably larger than the female and is far darker in plumage. Nearby, a flock of orange chats quietly waits in the shade. Chats possess a brush-tipped tongue much like that of the honey-eaters, and indeed, the two families are closely related to each other. As the other plains inhabitants take turns to bathe and drink, a more secretive species quietly approaches. This is a male cinnamon quail thrush. It is a terrestrial species which feeds in small family parties. It specialises in living in extremely sparsely vegetated terrain, where it remains camouflaged against the stones. For the birds here, this tiny pool is a precious escape from the summer's ferocious heat. Eventually, the blazing sun retreats from the gibber plains. Inland dotterels now emerge to feed on succulents and insects. Nearby, a little button quail huddles against the howling wind. At only 14 centimetres in length, the little button quail is tiny, but in response to the desert rains it has become plentiful here. Button quails differ from true quails in that the female is considerably larger and more brightly coloured than the male. 
she uses a loud booming call to attract males to her territory. But it is actually the male that incubates the eggs and feeds the chicks. His job though is short lived. The young are independent within a month and fully grown within two. Despite the recent heat, Large pools still exist in the creek channels that dissect the gibber plains and in ditches beside the Birdsville track. These small oases are encircled in luscious greenery which somehow grows despite the summer furnace. They will eventually dry up completely but while they last these shallow wetlands are a haven for multitudes of waterfowl. Hardheads, freckled, pink-eared and whistling ducks patrol the surface, while spoonbills and egrets feed in the shallows, and terns relentlessly dissect the air above. The most abundant duck is by far the pink-eared duck, a conspicuously plumaged species named after the small pink mark beside its ear. They feed by drawing water through the tip of their bill, and ejecting it out the bill's side, thus filtering any small suspended animals from the water. In the nearby vegetation, a group of flock pigeons feeds quietly and shelters in the shade. Flock pigeons earned their name from the thousand strong flocks they once existed in. Their eggs, laid on the ground, existed in such quantities that they would stain the wool of sheep that rested there. Today, their numbers are far less, although large flocks do sometimes occur. The males are distinctive, with a bold black and white head. The female and juvenile birds lack this, and possess a more subdued plumage. Back at the Cooper Creek, Flocks of cormorants parade along the waterway. The sheer number of birds present is staggering. It is hard to believe that only two years earlier nothing lay here but a bone-dry riverbed, devoid of the luscious greenery that now entombs its banks and the thousands of water birds that now grace its shores. A short distance from the ferry crossing, the Cooper enters Lake Kilampapana, a vast water body a kilometre wide and several kilometres long. Hundreds of little corellas gather on the banks to drink. Indeed, the surrounding country is now a banquet for seed-eating birds. The dunes are cloaked in seeding grass and flowering plants, which erupt from the ground after good rain. All this new growth has caught the attention of diamond doves. These small doves feed quietly on the ground, in flocks of twenty or more. They are nomadic and roam the inland in search of quality feeding grounds. At twenty centimetres they are comparable to the peaceful dove in size, a species which shares much of the diamond dove's distribution. The diamond dove is an abundant species across the floodplain in June country. Far less common is the banded whiteface. This tiny bird is an arid land specialist, requiring no surface water to survive. It is uncommon and highly nomadic across much of Australia's desert heart where it feeds on seeds and insects. But all this activity has not gone unnoticed. The region is awash with raptors. This is a Nanking kestrel and its nest is nearby. With a plentiful supply of insects, rodents and small birds, the kestrels are breeding prolifically taking advantage of the temporarily favourable conditions. The downy chicks here are quite young and struggling against the scorching summer heat. 
Despite their abundance, the kestrels are visibly outnumbered by the carrion-eating black kite. Their partially fork-tailed dark silhouettes fill the sky, in some places up to a hundred circle together, watching the ground for their next meal. The black kite has a vast range, which includes most of mainland Australia and also southern Asia, Europe and Africa. Here, it also shares the sky with Australia's largest bird of prey, the wedge-tailed eagle, which has a wingspan of up to 2.5 metres. These majestic raptors soar high on the thermals, up to two kilometres above the ground. The distinctive wedge-shaped tail of their silhouette aids identification. They often feed on carrion, but will also hunt their own prey. Back on the ground, and Australia's largest bird, the emu, is also taking advantage of the good times. This is a nomadic species, which can travel vast distances in search of fresh new growth. With plenty of succulent vegetation, this group of 20 birds is well fed, Plant matter like this is the staple of their diet, but they will also consume insects if they are available. Emus stand up to two metres in height, but are flightless. The remnants of their wings now hang uselessly at the bird's side. Although they lack flight, they are by no means defenceless. The emu's powerful legs can carry it at speeds exceeding 40 kilometres an hour. Far to the southeast, and the South Australian Mallee has also had a bumper year. The succulent growth has attracted a pair of scarlet-chested parrots. They feed inconspicuously on the fresh vegetation, quietly and methodically foraging for seeds. This is one of six neophema parrots that live in Australia. It is nomadic across a broad distribution that starts in Western Australia and includes most of SA. Despite the male's vibrant plumage, his green back provides effective camouflage from above. Nearby, the female has chosen to feed instead on grass seeds. She purposefully pulls each seed head to the ground where she pins them down with her feet and delicately extracts the tiny seeds. It is fascinating to watch. Nearby, in the top of a mallee tree, weebills have constructed their tiny nest. They return to feed their nestlings on insects gleaned from the foliage. At only 8 centimetres in length, they are Australia's smallest bird, it is difficult to imagine how small the tiny chicks must be. There is an abundance of insect life here, which has attracted flocks of 30 or more white-browed wood swallows that noisily dart about in the air above. Wood swallows are a common feature of the Australian deserts, nowhere more so than in the Streslecky Desert of northern South Australia. Here it is the black-faced wood swallow which abounds. They perch conspicuously on dead trees and bushes from which they launch into acrobatic pursuits of flying insects. The Streslecky Creek meanders for some 200 kilometres from the Cooper Creek across the Streslecky Desert and into Lake Blanche. In April 2008, it was a desolate dust bowl, with its water holes bone dry and the surrounding Coolabar floodplain struggling to survive. But in 2010, reprieve finally came. The Cooper Creek flooded, sending a torrent of water down the Streslecky Creek for the first time in 20 years. 
Accompanied by good rain, the floodwaters performed an unprecedented transformation. Life finally returned to the Streslecki Creek. Waterfowl flocked to the new habitat. Cormorants fly in formation along the creek searching for fish. In the shallows, spoonbills swish their heads from side to side. Anything that touches the bill's sensitive inside causes it to snap shut, thus capturing potential prey. Some trees are surrounded by water, and here, in the relative safety from predators, the waterfowl construct their large nest platforms. These are white-necked herons. A data is hunting for fish. Nearby, its mate sits quietly on their nest. It is positioned four metres up in a waterside tree. The four well-developed young huddle together, waiting for their parents to return with their next meal. Many larger cooler bars are also partly submerged, and for these, Nature has also devised a use. Fairy martins have plastered the tree trunks in clay nests. Some of the colonies contain up to 30 nests, each meticulously crafted from daubs of moist soil. Only in slow motion does the skill with which they fly directly into their nests become evident. Away from the primary creek channel, there are many small flooded wetlands. They provide the perfect home for gull-billed terns and pink-eared ducks. Gull-billed terns are distributed across every continent on Earth. In Australia, it is an inland rather than coastal species, which breeds on small islands in temporary inland wetlands like this. The Streselecki Creek's floodplain has also been transformed. In April 2008, the floodplain was almost devoid of life. Years of drought had taken their toll, ensuring that not a blade of grass adorned the bare earth between the struggling cooler bars. Yet, in a testament to its tenacity, the landscape has recovered beyond imagination. And at the front line of this spectacular recovery are the grasses. They have been quick to recolonise the floodplain, which is now carpeted in new growth. Their diverse seed heads sway in the morning breeze. This is a free-for-all buffet for seed-eating birds and they have taken full advantage of the inexhaustible cuisine. White caps floating in a sea of grass is all that denotes the presence of a familiar and endemic Australian cockatoo, the galah. Entire flocks of 50 birds seem to disappear behind a screen of seed heads as they quietly feed and meander across the ground. And they are certainly not alone. The air is constantly filled with a lively chatter of budgies. A true symbol of the outback, the key to the budgie's success is their ability to breed prolifically during good seasons, and this is one such season. Virtually every tree hollow contains a budgie nest, up to eight per tree. Many are barely above the ground, while others are an ingenious application for disused fairy martin nests. Each of these nests can contain up to eight young, and in a good season, the adults can have multiple broods. When the boom time eventually passes, they will be forced to disperse, 
waiting for the rains to return somewhere in the vast inland. For now, though, that place is right here. The rejuvenated floodplain is a haven for breeding birds, but they would be wise to keep an eye on the sky. The Australian hobby is a powerful hunter, and they too are nesting. Like the other falcons, though, the hobby does not build its own nest. Instead, it reuses an old raptor or falcon nest. Hobbies are now very common here, on account of the abundant prey. Though only 30 centimetres in length, they are fast and agile. This one has caught a small bird. Using its talons to pin the prey to its perch, the hobby tears portions from its body. Eventually though, all that is left is a single leg, and this the hobby downs in one gulp. Besides the beautiful hobby, other raptors have also arrived to exploit the bonanza. In the open grassland, a pair of spotted harriers has mated and are now building their nest. The massive platform of sticks sits barely two metres from the earth. The spotted harrier is the only harrier species in the world which does not nest on the ground. Harriers fly low over open country. Their broad wings seem to carry them effortlessly as they hunt small mammals, lizards, birds and insects. Their long legs enable them to pluck their prey from the grass. But the harriers are not alone. They have built their nest in the same tree as a pair of letter-winged kites. The kite's small nest has been built in the upper branches of the coolabar. With their respective nests only three metres apart, the two raptor species relentlessly harass each other. The tiny letter-wing kite is dwarfed by the mighty harrier, which possesses almost double the wingspan. This will surely be an eventful nesting season for both species. There are several other kite nests nearby. This is not unusual for the species, which sometimes nests in colonies. One particular nest already has three young in it. They wait quietly as their parent stands guard nearby. In favourable conditions, the kites will breed copiously, boosting the population, which will then be forced to disperse. In flight, the black W-shaped underwing markings make identification straightforward. Otherwise, the letterwing kite may be confused with the related black-shouldered kite. Letterwing kites are the only nocturnal raptor in the world. They are rare, feeding primarily on rodents such as the long-haired rat. Thus, their erratic movements are governed by the rodent plagues that occur after good rain. As night falls over inland Australia, it eventually becomes apparent why so many kites and harriers have chosen to nest here. House mice have plagued in response to the favourable conditions. This is an introduced species which breeds exceptionally fast. Females have an average of seven young per litter and up to ten litters per year. Their young can reproduce at the age of six weeks. This remarkably quick reproductive cycle allows them to populate favourable regions very rapidly. 
but there are native rodents here also. A family of dusky hopping mice live in this small tree hollow. They emerge at night to feed on plant seeds and shoots. Sadly, this beautiful species is listed as vulnerable, being found only in the Streslecki and Simpson deserts and in southwestern Queensland, although it was once widespread across central Australia. Like the other hopping mice, the dusky possesses powerful hind legs that enable it to jump proficiently. It disappears down its burrow at the slightest hint of danger. When dawn finally arrives, the rodents' nightly escapades are revealed, recorded in sand by hundreds of tiny footprints. With night time over, the letter-wing kites are roosting, but their diurnal cousin, the black-shouldered kite, is wide awake. Attracted by the abundance of rodents, insects and small lizards, the black-shouldered kites are now common here. They often hunt by hovering several metres above the ground, watching the grass intently for potential prey before dropping down to snatch their victim. On the bare limbs where they often perch, they are a conspicuous feature of the floodplain, something that cannot be said for the owls, which put great efforts into their concealment, none more so than the tawny frogmouth. Its cryptic plumage and motionless stance provide exceptional camouflage. But while the frogmouth spends its time looking like a branch, the owl at nightjar chooses to hide inside the tree itself. By day, it roosts in a hollow, something which the floodplain is certainly not short on. When it emerges at night, it feeds mainly on large insects, which also fall victim to another owl, the southern boobook. Like the owl at nightjar, the Boo Book is distributed across most of mainland Australia and Tasmania, a testament to its ability to exploit diverse habitats. The morning light reveals the slope of a sand dune, cloaked in fresh vegetation. Sheltered beneath a low shrub, a central netted dragon warily emerges from his burrow. The squat plant offers the perfect place to catch the sun's warm rays. He stays close to his burrow though, for nearby a red-backed kingfisher patiently surveys the ground for a potential meal. Viewed from behind, the bright red rump for which they are named is clearly visible. Red-backed kingfishers sit conspicuously on dead tree branches motionless, before suddenly dropping to the ground to catch an insect or a lizard. The distinctive song of the chirruping wedgebill. It is an almost constant feature of the Streslecki desert. The wedgebills live in parties of up to 20 birds which energetically forage for insects on the ground and in shrubs. Australia contains two wedgebill species, the chirruping and the chiming. It is thought that both were once a single species, which became split into two populations. These eventually evolved into the two species we see today. For the chiming wedgebill, we must now travel to the west. This is the Tanami Desert, home of the charming Wedgebill. Its call is synonymous with this landscape. Both Wedgebill species appear identical. It is their song that separates them. Though commonly heard, the charming Wedgebill is particularly wary when calling and it is quick to disappear into cover. Interestingly, two birds actually contribute to the call. One produces the repetitive component, 
while the other intermittently inserts a shorter note. Perhaps there is an extra uplift in their song, for now is certainly a great time to be a wedge bill. The Tanami Desert looks the best it has for many years. Clay pans lie awash with water. Like miniature inland seas, they tell of the wet conditions prevalent only months earlier. The desert rains have initiated a spectacular response from the arid vegetation, none more so than the grevillea species, which are now flowering profusely. Honey grevilleas laden with 20 centimetre long flowers rise like flaming sentinels from the spinifex plain. Holly grevilleas are also on full display. Emblazoned in crimson, they possess horrendously prickly leaves shaped like that of holly. This dramatic floristic display put on by the grevilleas has attracted insects and honey eaters. This is a black chinned honey eater. This golden backed form of the species is found from northwestern Queensland across the Northern Territory and into the Pilbara of Western Australia. It forages in the canopy of trees in small flocks or pairs, where it uses its stout bill to probe in the bark for insects as well as feeding on nectar. With plenty of food available, this pair is now breeding. Their tiny cup nest is delicately suspended in the outer foliage of a eucalypt, where it is all but invisible, camouflaged perfectly amid the leaves. It is only the arrival and departure of the adults that subvert the nest's concealment. There are other honey-eater species here too. By far the most abundant of these is the grey-headed honey-eater. Confined to the north of central Australia, it is usually associated with rocky country, but seems at home here on the Spinifex Plain. Grey-headed honey-eaters are extremely active, continuously darting through the foliage in pursuit of nectar and insects. They seem never to sit still. Dusk slowly settles over the Spinifex grassland. The swaying seed heads glow in the golden blaze of the retreating sun. Amidst this striking scene, a smooth knob-tailed gecko emerges into the night. It has spent the day concealed in a burrow beneath a Spinifex tussock, and now it is ready to hunt. As the gecko wanders in search of insects, its intricate red and brown patterning affords it excellent camouflage against the sand. It shares the desert with a variety of other reptiles, which hide in the spinifex, under rocks and in the nooks and crannies of termite mounds. It is hard to imagine that these earthen sculptures are constructed by thousands of tiny, blind termites. But indeed, they are, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. Some are over two metres tall, while others are short and narrow. Whatever their dimensions, they are abundant across the Spinifex plains and provide refuge to many animals. The fat-tailed Pseudoantichinus is one such species. It often spends the day sleeping in a termite mound, intermittently emerging to warm up in the sun. At night it preys on insects. The thick tail is used to store fat, which can be used as an energy reserve during times of drought. Open grassland and dune fields cover a vast extent of the Tanami Desert. But there are also rugged ranges, 
dominated by towering cliffs and the ever-present spinifex. The range country is punctuated by spectacular gorges. Some of these contain rock holes full of cool water. With water such a rare commodity out here, any pool like this attracts bird life from far around. Finch species like the painted finch feed on dry grass seeds which provide them with little moisture. They must frequent water regularly throughout the day and rarely travel far from it. It is interesting to note the drinking technique of the painted finch. When most birds drink, they scoop the water up, but some Australian grass finches and pigeons will suck it up instead, rather like drinking through a straw. This adaptation allows them to drink more efficiently in arid conditions. However, the painted finch does not conform to this behaviour. Instead, it uses its long bill to scoop the water up. Strange, considering the harsh conditions it contends with in Central Australia. Painted finches live in parties of ten or so birds, which quietly fossick among the stones for spinifex seeds. But here they are outnumbered a hundred to one by the zebra finch. Flocks of hundreds of zebra finches gather in the trees surrounding the waterhole. Their endless chatter carries far down the gorge. Then, in one colossal swarm, they crowd the water's edge, the sound of their whirring wings compounding the cacophony. There are many juvenile finches here, sporting a black rather than red bill. No bird seems to get more than a few seconds of drinking time before being driven aside by the next wave of finches. It is a phenomenal spectacle which illustrates the continual struggle for survival endured by the inhabitants of this unforgiving landscape. Diamond doves also need to drink regularly. They arrive here in small flocks which tentatively approach the pool. Perhaps it is the commotion of the other birds which makes them so timid. They stay only long enough to briefly drink before hurriedly departing on whirring wings. As the late afternoon progresses, a variety of other birds visit for a drink. A flock of little corellas noisily commandeers the waterhole. Their confident comic antics juxtapose the relentless chaos of the zebra finches earlier in the afternoon. With the sun now low on the horizon, the cliffs adopt their vivid hues, and the final few birds make their last visit for the day. An air of quiet tranquillity falls over the waterhole. A flock of common bronze wings inconspicuously emerges from the rocks. They are shy when drinking. Their slow approach to the waterhole is tentative in the extreme, but eventually they reach it. They demonstrate the sucking drinking technique very effectively as they rapidly draw the water up through the bill. Bronze wings are named after the iridescent patches present on their wings. In the right light, these shine, the colour changing as the bird moves its body. The rugged range country is home to another pigeon species, the spinifex pigeon. Against the red stones and concealing spinifex, these tiny pigeons are virtually invisible. Their camouflage is assisted further by their tendency to freeze motionless on the ground when disturbed. 
Spinifex pigeons exist in three separate populations, one in the Pilbara, one in the Kimberley, and the third in Central Australia and northwestern Queensland. Each population differs in the amount of white that is present on the bird's belly. The morning chorus of the charming wedgebill floats above the Spinifex plains, as it so often does. But this landscape is a ticking time bomb. Spinifex is inherently flammable, and nearby the inevitable result of this is plain to see. A fire has passed through here only recently, but the landscape is already recovering. New vegetation has sprung from the sand. This is the curious upside down plant, named after its flowers which originate from the plant's base, below the leaves. It, along with many other new plants, form a green carpet between the blackened stumps. This fresh, regenerative vegetation has attracted birds in unprecedented numbers. Banded whiteface, a usually uncommon species, feed on the ground everywhere. Their vibrant trills fill the air. Their abundance on this burnt country is surprising. There must be a great deal of seed and insect life here. Crimson chats are also present in strong numbers. They are a highly nomadic species across most of Central Australia. It is the male which possesses a splendid crimson plumage. They feed unobtrusively on the ground in small flocks. Plenty of new growth and seed has drawn large flocks of budgies to the area. They look almost like leaves when perched in the burnt branches. The remarkable post-fire recovery of this tiny patch of the Tanami Desert reflects the wider desert's transformation after the drought ending rains. It is one which saw waterfowl flock to the flooded Cooper Creek, as the Birdsville track was cut for the first time in 20 years. Immense flocks of budgies bred insatiably along the Streslecky Creek, as the once desolated floodplain was furnished in seeding grass. And in the Tanami Desert, grivaliers performed a stunning floristic display and a male rufous-crowned emu wren sang from his perch. These scenes of rejuvenation are merely a transient phase in the boom and bust cycle. Eventually the waters will dry and the drought will return with ferocity, until the next rains finally fall. And so this story ends where it began with an emu wren singing from a tiny corner of a breathtaking landscape. The Australian deserts in a good year.